Uh, thank you, Harry, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, Harry and Jaden, for inviting me to give a talk. And thanks, everyone, for uh, coming to the talk. Um, so today, I'll be talking about um, how to design a variational quantum algorithm and how to implement it for solving partial differential equations, and specifically nonlinear partial differential equations um, <clears throat> using a variational scheme. Uh, just a quick note. In this talk, there will be some pretty dense math, and I will try to pause for questions. I'll try to go slow, but if any if at any point anything doesn't make sense, uh, I think you can just hop in and uh, ask your question. Okay, so um, moving on, uh, overview of this talk. Um, first, I'll go over the motivation of why we want to. Um, use a quantum computer for solving PDEs. And then I'll be talking about the, the general overview of um, how VQAs work, specifically in this case, um, for solving PDEs. And then uh, we'll, we'll go into the details about designing cost functions for linear equations. And then we'll talk about nonlinear equations, which get kind of complicated. And in the end, we'll uh, briefly touch on some challenges uh, faced in this endeavor. <clears throat> okay, so first, motivation, right? Quantum com computers, what are they good for? Well, uh, we know that the information storage scales exponentially with the number of qubits, <clears throat> which is um, already impressive, but uh, one thing to keep in mind is that it's not just the information we care about. It's the ability, it's the ability to manipulate the information, um, which means that we can essentially do exponentially large matrix multiplications on these exponentially large um, vectors. Uh, so, so it's essentially list of numbers, right? But they're also noisy and analog machines for now. Uh, until we enter the fault tolerant age. So um, what can we get out of this? Well, we want to utilize the power of quantum computers to solve classically expensive PDEs. And um, I guess uh, the well, why I want to say classically expensive is because, um, especially for nonlinear uh, problems, uh, the kind of resolution dictates the accuracy of your solution. And, um, and for, for very chaotic systems, it, it explodes so fast that, um, that you're, you're going to be running out of memory before you can get anything uh, sensible out of the, of the, out of the simulation. Uh, so that's the main motivation behind designing this algorithm for solving PDEs. Okay, uh, variational quantum algorithm, <clears throat> right? Uh, in, in this case, we start with uh, an ontot circuit, which is just a parameterized quantum circuit um, and some initial parameters uh, for this, for this ontot circuit. And uh, we need a cost function for the specific equation we're investigating. We feed all three of these things into a quantum computer. We do, uh, we do some measurements uh, and we feed the results of, of uh, the quantum circuits. So that includes the parameter and the cost function. In this case, the cost function is the result uh, into a classical optimizer. The classical optimizer will take a look at, uh, at the cost and update the the parameters um, and feed it back into the parameterized quantum circuits. Um, we go through this loop a few times, and um, there's a there's a termination condition of if the cost is below a predefined epsilon, then we return the the lambda uh, or the a list of parameters. So um, one thing, two things to note here. Uh, one, um, as you probably know already, the we should note that the parameters are a list of numbers, right? They're not just one scalar. 
they're they're a vector, um, and that's where the that's where the solution is stored at. Now, um, the other thing I should point out is that uh, if you're familiar with uh, other variational quantum algorithms like the BQE, uh, you would notice that I mean, for one, they're very similar, but also um, in other cases, we're not interested in the lambda we output, right? We we uh, so say for the case of VQE, we're interested in the ground state energy, which which would be the cost. But in this case, we want the parameters, which will which give, give us the states uh, that represent the solution to your uh, partial differential equation. Now, if this part uh, if this part doesn't make sense right now, don't worry. That's why we're uh, doing the talk today. Uh, so today I'll be we'll be focusing on this part, the, the, the quantum part of the problem. And I should just note that this scheme was proposed by Lubash et al. Uh, in, I think, 2019. Um, and some uh, improvements have been made over the past two, three years. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a very exciting field. Um, OK, now let's jump into the details, right? Uh, the first thing we need to talk about is discretization. Uh, what that means is for some function u of x, uh, x comma t at t zero, we have, so, so this will be like a 1D function at a specific time, right? And um, we discretize the function by taking the values of um, evenly spaced points on this function, spacing delta x. Now, and, and then, we store this list of numbers in a vector form. Uh, so, so we turn into we turn it into an n-dimensional vector uh, where big N is uh, two to the n power, uh, where small n is the number of qubits. Um, but uh, and um, and then we can turn this vector into a quantum state. Uh, this is conventionally called amplitude encoding because you're encoding information into the amplitude of your quantum states. So in general, C uh, is a complex number, but for most of the PDEs we're interested in, your, um, your function is going, to be, is going to be real only. So in most cases, C is going to be real for us, but just note that it can be complex and that can, potentially uh, give us more uh, power to work with. Okay, uh, just to give like a really simple example of how we can use this, uh, we'll be talking about the 1D Poisson equation, uh, which is given by the Laplace of U equals F, where F is just some initial condition and you're trying to solve for U. Right, so this is used uh, a lot in physics, um, and uh, just a quick vector calc refresher. The Laplace equation in one dimension is just the second derivative, um, second spatial derivative. So, um, so moving on, right? What is a derivative? Well, uh, in, in, in our case, uh, instead of for continuous function, if we look at a discretized function, so a list, uh, so a, a vector form, right? Um, the finite difference derivative is going to be defined as, the first order is just f of x plus delta t minus f of x over delta, sorry, f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. Right, so so this is just if you take two neighboring points, you uh, you subtract one from the other and then divide it by the, the the grid spacing, you get the first order derivative. And if you um, apply this twice, you can get you can you can get this expression for the second derivative. Um, so, well, how can we use this? Right, in our case, um, well. Let's just focus on the second order derivative because that's that's uh, what we had for the Poisson equation. Um, now, if you write out uh, this vector here, right, we can see that uh, if you okay, if you take this vector 
shift everything up by one, you get this vector. And then shift everything down by one, you get this vector, right? And that means uh, if you take any line, and, and then if you, um, if you uh, combine everything in this form, then if you take any line, you will get exactly this second order derivative. So, um, and, and this is, this is actually uh, nothing quantum. It's just how you numerically compute the derivatives. Um, but we turns out we can actually do this on a quantum computer if you uh, amplitude your function into a quantum state. Right. Uh, but you have Which, the border problem. Sorry, what's that? You have the, por the border problem because you, you use uh, xn uh, with x uh, zero. Yes, you know, yes, uh, it's, it's, yes, that's true. So, um, so uh, yes, it's good that you pointed out because this is actually one of the, the, the challenges that, that this algorithm faces is that it's inherently really good at doing um, periodic boundary conditions, but for other boundary conditions, um, it's not entirely clear how we can do it efficiently which we'll talk about later. Thank you for uh, pointing that out. Um, so this is where we talk about the, uh, where we introduce this operator called the, the adder operator, right? Uh, and all it does is um, if you have a quantum vector, if, if you have a vector, right? You apply the adder operator to it, it shifts it up or down by one, down or up by one, I should say. Um, and if you're not familiar with the broadcast notation, this is just uh, a transpose vector. So uh, so it's annihilating your ith state and then uh, giving you the, the, so moving the amplitude of ith state into the i plus one state. Um, and as we mentioned previously, we're going to have the, 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 the boundary problems because uh, it's, it's periodic. Um, now, uh, moving on, how do we do? So, so now that we have the, the quantum operators, um, how can we turn this into a quantum finite, uh, finite difference derivative? Well, we can say that this finite difference derivative is, equip, is equivalent to applying this uh, quantum version of, um, of Laplace operator, which is just an adder minus an identity plus an adder dagger. Uh, and uh, which means for our Poisson equation, uh, it's going to be equivalent to um, lambda naught times uh, the Laplace operator uh, times your your solution state equals some some given uh, initial condition state. Um, now we need this lambda naught here because. Um, in general, quantum states need to have L2 norm uh, equals one, right? So uh, in this case, we actually set the initial condition uh, to a L2 norm one state, uh, which means psi in general is not going to be, so like your solution is not going to have L2 norm one, which means you need a scaling factor in front of it. Um, and, and, and this scaling factor is also part, part of the solution because I, you don't know what it is, right? Um, okay. Uh, okay, now we're gonna talk about the, the cost function. <clears throat> so uh, if we take a look at the, the quantum version of our Poisson equation, we can say that, well, this, so the left-hand side turn, turns out to be a vector the right hand side is a vector, we can just find the Euclidean distance between the two vectors, right? Which is, uh, which turns out to be, uh, if you plug in the, the adders for, for the Laplace operator, and then, um, and then you do some math, you will get an expression that looks like this, which is kind of daunting, but do note that, um, a bra and a ket gives you an inner product, which is just a number, right? So uh, the thing to note here is that 
if there's some way to if there's some way to compute this, it gives you a scalar, a scalar that you can feed into your classical optimizer, um, and uh, and the, the optimizer can use it to uh, update your parameters. Okay, so uh, now the nat nat natural question is: How do you compute expectation circuits such as uh, psi adder psi? Right. Well, turns out there is there is this tool called the Hadmark test. Um, I think there is get, a question a question from the chat. Yes. Um, Ah, um, why would I call that an initial condition? Um, I think, um, so the initial condition, I, I, I guess it will be more accurate uh, for I to call it an initial condition for time dependent equations uh, where you have to do a time evolution of um, your, your function at each time step, right? But in this case, um, Let's say uh, f. So um, I think the Poisson equation can be used uh, in in say electromagnetism, where you have uh, where you have some field and uh, and you want to find the the charge distribution, right? Uh, so the so, so, so in this case, when I say initial condition, I mean, I, okay, I guess all, all, I, all I'm trying to say is F is a given, right? It's, it's what we know and psi is what we have to solve for. It's, uh, that's, that, that, that's all it is. There's nothing, um, right, yes, yes, it's a, it's a force function. Um, Thank you for the question. Uh, okay, so how do we compute expectations such as psi adder psi? Well, uh, turns out there's this circuit called the Hadamard test, where you just introduce um, one and still a qubit, and uh, you control the adder by this ancilla and you only have to do one measurement on the ancilla qubit. Uh, so the expectation value of this measurement will give you the expectation value of this circuit, um, of this of this bracket in the product. So I won't go into details about the, the derivation of the Hadamard test. You can look it up on the internet, but it's 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 actually very fascinating. And um, so if it's not immediately obvious why we want to do something like this is because, well, uh, the alternative, right, would be doing something like a, a quantum state tomography on psi, which you need to do um, an, an exponential amount of times before you can get a reasonable state out of psi. And then, um, and, and, and then apply the, the adder post-processing, right? And that becomes, that defeats the purpose of this algorithm because you want to do everything in a quantum circuit, right? You don't want to get the data out uh, at any stage uh, because if you do that, then you're doing all the work that, that you're trying to avoid, uh, if that makes sense. <clears throat> um, and so this is one special case of the Hadamard test and there is a, more general case of the Hadamard test, um, where uh, you also have to control the the state preparation circuit here. Uh, so uh, where uh, u of psi on the zeroth vector gives you psi, and then u of f on the zeroth vector gives you f. Um, and oh, I see. What do I have more questions? Um, Ah, so um, the initial condition F. So the question is, is the initial condition F easy to prepare? Well, that's that's, uh, that's a really interesting question because uh, preparing the, the initial condition F is a problem very similar to 
preparing or to um, to find an ansatz? And the short answer is no, it's not easy to prepare. It's not uh, generally easy, but uh, there are um, there are circuits such as uh, there's one uh, ansatz called the ZGR um, ansatz where uh, you can, where it takes in the n number of parameters and it gives you an exact state. But now uh, these circuits are usually very expensive and on this devices, they just do not work. Um, so that remains an open uh, problem for, for efficiently using uh, this algorithm. Um, yeah, okay, moving on. Uh, and we have a updated view of this variational quantum algorithm for solving PDE, right? Uh, let's say we take and we take some PDE and we know now how to construct the cost function. We haven't talked about the onset circuit, but uh, that's just, that's a whole nother problem. So we're just gonna assume we have some onset circuit that we can use. And uh, we'll just start with some uh, initial parameters, let's say just random parameters that we fit into the ansatz. We we now we have these expectations, uh, Hadmar test circuits um, and some linear combination of your results will be uh, taking, taking this form here for the cost function will be fed into the classical optimizer. The classical optimizer takes a look at the cost, updates the parameter and feeds the, feeds the new lambda into your um, into your uh, uh, your expectation circuits, and you 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 keep uh, going for a few rounds, and uh, in the end uh, you terminate if it's uh, smaller than an epsilon. Um, so, uh, and that's the basic idea of how you would go about solving PD uh, on a quantum computer using the variational method. Um, okay, uh, I, I, this would be a good time to, oh, no more questions. Okay, so can we do better? Yes, yes, we can. Uh, because uh, there is another method of constructing cost function uh, introduced by Sato et al, uh, I think um, sometime a year ago. Um, it's, it's the en energy minimization method, <clears throat> right? So this part is uh, going to be a little more advanced. Uh, it's, the idea comes from uh, classical mechanics in physics where um, you can use the Euler-Lagrange equation for, for the system of interest, right? So if, uh, so let's say for some, uh, for a given PDE, you can you can write out the Lagrangian of that PD and um, the integral of that Lagrangian over all of space is your action, right? Um, now, if this doesn't make sense, don't worry. Bec uh, but what you need to take away is that so so like so like if you take a look at the action, so uh, note to note as S here, which change it into E is that if you minimize the action, you solve the, the equation. Right? You can think of this as, say, just finding the energy of a, of a physical system. Right? And we know that, um, that physical systems in general tend to keep um, the, the ground energy, and, uh, and that's an intuition behind, uh, behind writing the, the Euler-Lagrange equation. Um, uh, and um, I would like to point out that uh, if you have taken classical mechanics, uh, you would you would know that like normally we look at a system, we write out the Lagrangian, and we derive the equation for the system, right? So uh, so in this case, our problem is actually inverted. We know of um, we know of the equation, and we are trying to find the Lagrangian of that equation. And it turns out this problem is actually a very non-trivial problem. And um, 
yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this more later. Uh, but like I said here, minimizing the action means we solve the we solve the PD, right? And um, if you look at these two integrals here, you should note that these are the same thing as just inner products, right? So, so in a way, as daunting as this equation seems, we know exactly how to do this on a quantum computer. All it is is a uh, oh this uh, there is a mistake here. This should be a Laplace operator because um, if you have um, the two first order um, derivative of u dotted with each other, you just get the you just get the inner product and and taking the integral over space, you get the inner product of u second order derivative u, right? And this is just the um, the inner product between u and f. So in this case, psi and f. Um, and if you do more math on this, you get an expression that looks like this, um, which turns out to be only three terms. Uh, if you remember the, the cost function we had for the Poisson equation a few slides back, uh, using the Euclidean uh, distance minimization uh, way, it's a lot longer, right? So a lot more complicated. Um, and uh, you might note that lambda naught or lambda zero here disappears on the on the last line. The reason why we can do that is we can uh, we can solve for the uh, partial derivative of e with respect to lambda and set equals to zero, set equal to zero, right? And you just solve for lambda using this derivative, and that gives you um, an analytical expression for lambda zero uh, at the point when this equation is minimized, uh, which is a neat tri trick they can use to, to simplify to simplify this, this equation. Um, and uh, you can also apply it to the previous uh, cost function, uh, but, but I, I believe you don't actually get rid of any term in that case. So a little comparison, cost function performed before using Euclidean distance minimization, seven expectation circuits. Um, the cost function derived using energy minimization, three expectation circuits. And that's a huge improvement because for each expectation circuit, although we only have to do one measurement, we need the expectation of that measurement, which means um, we're talking about at least thousands of shots um, on uh, on the circuits. So the fewer we can get away with, the better. And uh, the other reason why this, so it's not just fewer circuits, right? If, if it's fewer circuits, we have reasons to believe that it's also easier to optimize because the landscape is less complicated um, <clears throat> and also less prone to noise. So we want to be able to simplify cost functions. But like I said, finding the Euler-Lagrange equation is not a trivial problem. And thus, as the equations get more complicated, uh, it becomes more and more difficult to simplify these cost functions. Uh, do we have... Yes, I will talk about nonlinear equations uh, very soon. Uh, there was a question. Uh, okay, so now let's move on to time-dependent uh, PDEs. So in general, a time-dependent PDE will take a form that, that looks like this, where the where you have a uh, time derivative that equals um, O hat of U, where O is a linear or nonlinear combination of spatial derivative operators. Um, now, uh, if you remember what we had before, um, oh, sorry. Uh, what I meant to say is now we, we need to discretize time, right? So, uh, so U of T plus delta T equals one plus delta T times uh, O hats of U, right? So this, is, this would be like forward in time, excuse me, forward in time um, Euler method for, ti uh, for time discretization. Uh, and here is something. Here is a. Here is what the heat equation using a Gaussian uh, initial condition will look like. 
uh, with each time step, right? So, so you're you're solving uh, discrete time steps um, for the heat equation. Uh, now uh, we take this forward in time uh, disc discretized uh, equation, um, and we say, okay, let's denote the the new time step as lambda tilde psi tilde and the old time step as lambda psi. Uh, oh, I should say, so like in this case, our initial condition would just be, right? And we're trying to solve for the next time step. So we're, we're given psi and we're trying to so solve for psi tilde. Um, we, we get something like this and uh, with some combination, because as I note, O hat can be a linear or, or nonlinear combination of uh, of oper of uh, spatial derivative operators. You can just combine everything, including this lambda tilde here, and get something that looks like this, right? So 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 this is so this should really be O prime, and this is just an O of so like um, all of your derivative derivative operators and constants are absorbed into this O hat. Um, the reason why lambda is not absorbed here is because um, it's going to be, because this is also part of the solution, right? Um, oh, I should say uh, these two should be changed uh, because we're trying to solve for psi, right? So this is the new time step. This is the old time step. I uh, apologize for the confusion. Um, okay, so for a time-dependent uh, PD, how do we write the cost function, right? Well, we do the same thing. We have the uh, we have the Euclidean uh, distance. We try to minimize that, um, where uh, u of theta uh, on the zeroth state gives you psi, and then v of uh, v on zeroth state gives you uh, psi tilde. And that, if you uh, expand it out, gets becomes a term that looks like this, uh, which again is just an equation of um, expectation uh, circuits, um, and and uh, now we can go back to to this diagram. Um, we start with some initial condition. We feed it into a quantum, uh, quantum computer. Go go through the loop, right, and then um, we terminate with this termination condition with our lambda and that lambda is going to be the the solution for the for the function at the first time step. Also, this gets fed back into uh, the quantum computer because your uh, first time step now becomes your initial condition, and you try you and you use that to solve for the second time step, right? So 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 you repeat this process. For the entire time evolution of um, of this, this equation solving process, uh, <laughs> so yes, it's uh, it is an explicit uh, schema, and if you're uh, and it's an almost an exact analog of a of a classical solver, uh, with the the caveat being, we can now handle much large data. Uh, Quickly on a quantum computer, um, and, and and yes, I, I think I think it is beautiful, uh, and and you can also uh, implicit more stable implicit methods, um, but that comes with a cost, right? Like the more stable you are, uh, you need smaller time steps, you need more expectation circuits, and it's it's a trade off. Okay, uh, moving on to the next part. How do we do higher dimensions? So we talked about encoding a one-dimensional function into a vector, right? Now, if you have, say, a two-dimensional function, x and y here, um, all you have to do is line up these points like this. Uh, and this gives you the 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 solution right you can just get the solution from post processing but uh but now how do we do the uh derivative operator 
Well, it turns out for higher uh, for higher dimensions, um, say for two D functions stored on a uh, two n qubit space. Oh, uh, before we move on, I, I should say that. So, like, if you want another dimension, you just store uh, store all the points again in one list, right? Because that that's that's your quantum vector. That's the only way you can store it. But the but the nice thing about this is uh, so for say for n dimensions, you only need n times m uh, qubits. So right. So like if you want uh, if you want one dimension to be say uh, sixteen grid points, right, and that corresponds to four qubits. If you want a sixteen by sixteen by sixteen grid, all you need is all you need is twelve qubits. So it, so it grows uh, linearly with the with the number of dimensions um, instead of exponentially. Uh, although that might be obvious. Uh, okay, so for derivatives in higher dimensions. Let's say for a 2D function stored in a 2n qubit state, right? All you need to do is the uh, derivative on you, you do the you do the Laplace operator like we defined before on the first n uh, qubits, and then you do it on the last n qubits. If you have more dimensions, you just do it on each set of n qubits um, for each dimension, and that. That gives you the derivative in higher dimensions. Now, uh, I, I'm not sure if this is this is clear. Like, it, I'm not sure if it's clear why this works, but uh, you can think of it as like um, the the Laplace operator, right? Is is just um, uh, partial partial x squared plus partial partial y squared, uh, which means I mean you, you could you just you could you could do it separately. Uh, you just do the do the der derivative on the on the x direction and the, and then on the y direction separately and then combine the combine the results um, and uh, yes where uh, delta n is the derivative operator on n qubits and i is the identity operator so you don't do anything on, on the on the remaining uh, qubits uh, and that's how how you would do higher dimensions See, do we have question? Um, yes. So, uh, okay. So, there's a question about restriction on time step width. Um, the so depending on the the scheme, um, whether it be being implicit or explicit, the time step is going to. Um, is going to decide your uh, your I guess stability um, because your uh, because the the uh, time discretization has an error of um, O of delta t squared um, if you use a forward method um, which means the smaller the better right but but if you have too small of a time step then uh, it becomes again expensive to to solve, um, which is another challenge. Uh, it, it's a, a and a trade off um, in designing and choosing parameters, hyperparameters for for this scheme. So uh, finally, we arrive at the nonlinearity uh, part. Um, let's take a look at a at say the Navier-Stokes equation, which is used for computational fluid dynamics, right? It takes this form, and um, and if you take a look at this equation, you will see that the nonlinearity arises from this term here, right? Which is which is saying that uh, your your uh, after taking the the gradient of v, you have to dot v to gradient of v, right? So so each component. Uh, so say so say if v is two dimensional, you're gonna have like v of x times uh, a gradient of v of x. So that means if we uh, take the general form, 
we want something that's like this, right? We'll want to be able to do point-wise uh, multiplication between two quantum states. Uh, but this point-wise multiplication uh, has a problem where it's not a unitary operation, right? So we know, excuse me, um, quantum operations have to be unitary. So it's not something we can just do, right? Uh, which, which is what makes uh, this problem is especially interesting for, for trying to integrate on a quantum computer, right? So how do we do it? Well, we know that uh, if you, so, so Okay, so the idea is that you use another set of qubits uh, and such that you can, so such that globally you're unitary, but locally you're, uh, locally you don't have to stay unitary. Uh, now what does that mean? That means, so like, say, if you apply uh, U of sine, U of phi on, on two sets of qubits, right? You get the, uh, the Kronecker product between the two states. Which just means you want that you get psi zero zero phi zero zero psi zero zero phi zero one and so on. Um, and now, if you apply a uh, controlled, uh, if you apply CNOS between um, between each qubits, uh, each qubit in these set of qubits, you can actually get something that looks like this, right? Because if you think about it, it's like you flip the one um, on the side wherever there is a one, that you flip the bit on the side wherever there is a one on the phi. Uh, so this becomes one, one, this becomes one, zero, this becomes zero, one, and you get that. And this is exactly what we want, right? Except it's only a subspace of, um, of the entire, entire hyperspace or, or, or the entire vector. So now the question becomes, how do we extract this substate from the larger state? Well, we can do it easily. Like, yes. Um, you already had uh, this state. Uh, why you do the um, the control operators to have this state? What you have in the yes. Uh, so. So if you don't do the so if you only have these two um, these two onslaught states right you will get something that looks like this uh, actually can you see my mouse um, if if I'm moving this yes yes, yes. okay good so uh, oh shoot. okay you you will get the Kronecker product between the two states but uh, and and we know that the the point wise multiplication uh, all of the all of this data is going to be some subset of this larger state, right? So uh, the reason why we do uh, the C naught is just to bring these points up to um, up to the first part of uh, of your um, uh, uh, of your state, and, and uh, why this is important is is going to be uh, is going to become clear uh, on the next slide. But does that make sense? It's like, uh, yes, of course you can carry. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Hopefully. So, so like this. This is this is what we want, right? Um, now, so it turns out we can't do this. this is, so it turns out we can't easily just extract this state without doing something, say, like the tomography. But what we can do is again use the Hadamard test um, where if you produce the pointwise multiplication uh, of between these two states uh, in a controlled fashion right and uh, and if you apply a uh, side dagger um, you can actually just oh, extract so, so so this sorry this circuit gives you the expectation of uh, of this bracket in a product. Um, so, okay. Um, the reason why this works is because uh, you can actually think of this as um, taking the inner product between uh, psi 
uh, quantum product with the zeroth state on the last two qubits, right? Which means, uh, which means the expectation you're getting is is only the the top four entry um, quantum. Uh, sorry, the top top four entry in a product with with the size state, right? Because because the 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 chronicle product of the zero here um, decides that that you're only looking at these numbers. So um, and this way, you introduce nonlinearity, and you can and if we can do um, if we can do products of states, we can essentially do anything, right? Because like let's take an extreme case, say uh, the exponential function. Well, you just uh, you just you just uh, Taylor expand it uh, into um, into a infinite polynomial and then truncate it to approximate the the the, the exponential function, uh, and this allows us to do essentially any nonlinear equation um, using a trick like this, right? And it's only uh, one ancilla qubit for the Hadamard test, and then n ancilla qubits for the uh, for <laughs> For each multiplication you want to do, All right? So, so obviously, for some functions it's going to be easier, and for some functions it's going to be a lot harder. Um, okay. Before I move on to the challenge, oh, no more. Okay. Uh, lastly, we'll talk about the challenges. Uh, first, cost function design. We've talked talked about this already, but uh, there is actually a really interesting paper. Uh, from I th 30 years ago of like how you would in general design or, or find the Euler-Lagrange equation um, for any system uh, by, by, uh, a by a computational physicist called Tonti. Um, and that was, that was before like you knew about quantum computing, I guess. Um, but it's in general, not a simple problem. So, so like here I have the Euler-Lagrange equation, you're trying to find the a Lagrangian such that it satisfies this condition. Um, the next challenge is Ansatz design, right? We, we, we also uh, talked about this uh, because someone asked the question about it, but um, it's the, the Hubert space is exponentially large, right? That's where we get the power of this method. But that also means um, if we, if we, that also means we want the number of parameters to be much less than the order of two to the two to the n, because uh, if we want to use like the sycamore chip or uh, or even larger the the the, the hundred qubit um, um, quantum computers, we can't like we don't have a computer uh, that can handle two to the one hundred number of parameters, uh, let alone optimizing it, right? Uh, but but then but then it becomes a trade-off between expressivity and um, and reducing the number of parameters. So that's again an open problem, uh, which brings us to this third point: optimization. Uh, here is uh, here is a diagram I got from Penny Lane uh, that talks about the barren plateau problem, and uh, uh, what it means is that like for for these uh, variational quantum algorithms, you're going to have a uh, vanishing gradient, right? So some uh, proposed method of solving that, including like using a local cost function, excuse me, shown here, uh, which makes the line uh, landscape a lot easier to navigate, right? Because like you can imagine if you start at a point here and you move around and you don't see any change in cost. And you say, oh, are we at the are we at the the lowest cost? But I, you just you just can't find the the optimized uh, op, optimi optimal value. And um, this we also talked about um, unintentionally uh, the, uh, the boundary conditions because, uh, like we said, um, the the adder only applies to periodic uh, to periodic functions. Now there have been proposed ways of uh, go of getting around this problem. Say you can just apply correction uh, corrections circuits to your cost function, right? Because like 
if you think about it, you just have to remove terms like this. You, you don't want um, you don't want x not to turn into x n. Um, but then, but 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 then again, you introduce more circuits, and it becomes more expensive. Um, and lastly, readout is also a problem, right? So if you think about the onslaught design, and if you have um, if you have your the number of parameters be much less than um, <clears throat> than the the number of grid points, and somehow still you still get the right answer. Um, how like how do you get meaningful information from that list of parameters, right? Because you don't want to do state tomography on fifty qubits or hundred qubits or a thousand qubits, right? It just it's just impossible. Um, so so now um, there are ways around that. So you can like take uh, um, yeah. So the uh, that's the 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 last piece of of designing of an uh, a VQA for for solving PD. Um, and that concludes my presentation. I uh, mainly used these two references. Uh, first one by Lubash, second one by Sato that uh, both I talked about. Um, and if you're interested in this problem, uh, you should go check out these two papers. And uh, th there are actually more advanced techniques now, um, but mostly it's going to be the Lubash method, um, uh, some variation of it. And thank you. Uh, I guess we have, question for, uh, we have time for questions. Uh, okay, there's a question about if I'm familiar with differential <coughs> quantum circuits um, for solving. No, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, is it? No, I. Hmm. Inspired by PN. No, sorry, it's not something I've looked into. Okay, uh, actually, I get a, a, one question. Uh, do you think uh, for like, uh, for using these VQAs for PDE, do you think it's uh, like computation, computational expensive? Like if we uh, actually address this method on the real quantum machine? Uh, yes, so, uh... There are okay. If we if we go back to the so if we go back to the diagram, right? The mm -hmm. uh, in general, uh, I think it, it is going to be quite expensive because so like the the onslaught circuit is not um, entirely clear how how we can easily construct. Um, if there are problems with like optimizing uh, hardware efficient onslaughts, but that's only the first part, right? If you take a look at this, you have to control all of these adders and um and the design of adders i haven't talked about in this talk but um generally it's it's a trade-off between, between number of fancillas and the circuit depth right so you either have um about n ancilla qubits for approximately linear depth or you need a whole bunch of controls if you don't want to use that cella. Um, so that part is always also going to be expensive. Um, but if these problems we can solve, like uh, the power right comes from doing these really large exploitation circuits. And that I think um, like is really going to shine because it doesn't it doesn't grow. It, it it doesn't grow with number of qubits. So uh so yeah, I guess there are problems now, but it's promising, I should say. Yeah, yeah, thank you. 
Yeah. And I think there are one, there is one question uh, in the chat chat box. Yes. So the question is, how would decoherence and gate fidelity affect the size of PDs to be solved? Um, so, OK. So the, uh, the nice thing about this algorithm is that right, like it works on MISC devices, uh, works on MISC devices because um, you're getting expectation <laughs> values, right? So if there's some noise, it could potentially be washed out uh, by doing the expectation. So if it's not, so so yeah, so so like there there is hope that that uh, no, I I shouldn't say there is hope. I, I should say that uh, that if the noise is not too large, maybe it wouldn't affect the size. Um, but uh, there's also this thing called uh, noise-induced barren plateau for optimization, uh, which is a whole nother problem uh, that says like, uh, even if you use all the tricks we know to solve the barren plateau for classical optimization, if you have noise in your system, that's, that's still going to cause a vanishing gradient and that makes the optimization impossible. So I think that's going to be the main challenge other than just getting nonsense uh, from, from the expectation circuits, right? Because like if it's too noisy, you get nothing out. And uh, and I would say for current stage uh, devices, that's that's what we're seeing, so. And I think there's, there, there has another question raised on the chat box from Jackson. Oh, I'm not seeing, oh, I just see it. Uh, uh, no, I don't have um, results uh, available at this point. Oh, I see the question. Yes, is there any way to avoid discretization in solve PD with a continuous variable quantum computer? Um, hmm. You know, I'm not familiar with continuous variable uh, computation. I would imagine if if that's what I think it is, then yes. But uh, it might not be because, like, because like everything here, all the construction of cost function would we'll talk about are gate based, right? So uh, you might have to sit and think about how you would implement uh, these cost functions. But that could be an interest way, interesting way of doing this. I see uh, DQC, I'll look into that. I think Achari just offered to give a talk uh, <laughs> yes, I would. I, I would personally. I would love to hear it. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Sure. So it's yeah, so sure. welcome to provide. Give us a talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so could you provide us a like email address to contact? Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? I think uh, <clears throat> Kun Li has a question, so. Yes, so the question is, is it possible to change the basis of I into other bases? Uh, though I'm not entirely sure what that means. Um, because, uh, Right, like if you're doing amplitude encoding, <clears throat> if you change it to another basis, it, that's it, that would just be applying a global uh, a global face to the right. Yes, ah, yes, for a basis, yes. So, uh, okay, that that yes, that makes sense. So, so yes, that's definitely something you can do. Uh, 
um, which I, I don't think has been talked about a lot um, in literature, where uh, if you use the quantum Fourier transform, um, you can solve it in, uh, in Fourier space, uh, which could be promising. Uh, yeah, but uh, just to finish up the the previous question, um, I don't know a whole I I don't know a whole lot about how that will work exactly. There's some work done by my colleagues on this, and uh, <laughs> I'll do a little advertisement. The papers should be coming out really soon, and uh, um, it's uh, it's 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 very exciting work. Um, now the next question is: Is there any example that that evaluates the PDE result to a simple scalar. State tomography for the full state vector is resource demanding. Um, yes, so, um, so, so, so yes, there, there, so one example I can provide, right, is say, if you wanna do the readout uh, and uh, I, can, I actually can't remember like the physical interpretation of, uh, of such a thing, but <clears throat> say you have a state, right? And um, you're interested in the in the integral of the square of the function, right? And in that case, you can just uh, you can just use the the sorry the integral of the state uh, the the integral of the square. Um, you can just use the nonlinearity trick we talked about uh, and then get the expectation from that, right? Using the Hadamard test. So, so the Hadamard test uh, should be uh, what you're thinking about if you want to get a scalar out of, um, out of the, the PD results. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if that's helpful. Uh, But yes, you're right. Like full state uh, state tomography for the entire state vector is not realistic. It's not going to work. Um, but um, <clears throat> okay, I guess the better answer would be like it depends on your equation, right? Like uh, you have to think about what you care about in these um, in these solutions. 